The saint that we're honouring is an interesting character, given the context in which he was living. Cajetan, that comes from the Italian Cayetano, actually it was the Bishop Cayetano Bonicelli who ordained us, and on this feast we tend to think about him, actually had another brother, a bishop. That's quite rare to have two bishops in one family. But this saint was born in the area of Vicenza, that's the north of Italy, where it is still quite strong in faith. Actually, it became a center in itself of Marian devotion because Our Lady appeared there in Monte Berico centuries ago in a period of plague. She appeared to a common peasant and urged that a church be built in her honor and she would protect and save the area from this plague. They hummed and hoard and thought, hmm, we'll see about that. But it actually worked. And Italy is full of such local sanctuaries where heaven came in points of dire need to earth. In fact, where I was involved with near our monastery on a weekly basis, Sajana, they had a local sanctuary there. There were three churches functioning still in the town, and the one at the bottom of the mountain was used quite a lot still, not least because all the funerals practically happened there. It was also next to the graveyard. Well, that had a story something similar, and we know it from local tradition that it went something like this. I say it because it's the month of August, and in fact, on the 15th of August, there was a huge celebration in that church. It was a lovely moment of Italian-style piety, a bit of colour. Anyway, what happened was this. There was this poor family, and the wife was really at the end of her tether. She could not make ends meet, and there was a danger of actually losing her family through just famine. She wanted her husband to try his best to get some kind of work, anything at all, in the area. So she sent him out. He spent the day trying as hard as he could to get employment, but there was nothing doing at all. Eventually, he realized the situation they were in. There was no way out. Something quite dangerous could have happened. But then heaven intervened. The woman had no means at all. But then something prodded her to go to what is called in local Italian the Madia. It's a kind of press, as you'd say in Irish, a big sort of flat cupboard. She opened it. It was full full of the best grain. And from then on until right now, that is honoured as the Madonna della Carità, the Madonna of Charity, and they built a beautiful sanctuary there, still in use. A reminder that in the common life of the people, not spectacular saints, but mothers and fathers like yourself, Heaven is concerned and intervenes. Indeed, there come to me quite a few testimonies of things like that that happen, that a big sum of money is needed and it comes to the exact penny just in the nick of time through some engineering of events by a wise brain and a vision that we call providence. Anyway, this saint was born of an aristocratic family in the area I mentioned, Vicenza. He was 12 years old at the time of the discovery of America, that's 1492. He received a doctorate in canon law at the University of Padua, now that was like the Oxford of the area, in 1505, and became proto-notary, apostolic, and secretary to Pope Julius II in Rome. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1517 and remained in Rome for 13 years. 
where the cry of the Fifth Lateran Council was, the Church needs a universal and radical reform. Now notice the dates in question. It's just before the rebellion in Germany. In 1517, Cajetan and John Peter Carafa transferred the Company of Divine Love to Rome. It had been promoted by St. Catherine of Genoa and was dedicated to works of charity for the sick poor. At the same time, Martin Luther began his polemic against the Catholic Church. Now, working here are wisdom and man together. For God, at this time, was raising up forces of reform within the Catholic Church, one after the other, and not just in Italy. The work of the company soon included the incurable syphilitics, people who had disease from bad behaviour, essentially, who were cared for by a certain Hector Bernazza at the Hospital of St. James in Rome. Later the work spread to Vicenza, Verona and Venice. So our saint returned to his own Vicenza in 1520 to care for his sick mother and became rector of the Church of St. Mary. But in 1523 he went back to Rome, where, at the advice of his Dominican confessor, he organised an institute of clerks regular. Now that's the beginning of an important movement, calling priests to live together. That would give them a certain fraternity, charity and humanity, which protected them from the needs for consolations outside and all that that might entail as regards illicit behaviour, which precisely was what the Holy Spirit was trying to clean up. The society had three functions. Preaching. Now that was important given the context, because people need a powerful word and a word which was meant to be heard. Alphonsus Ligmore wanted that the simplest woman at the back of the church should understand every word of his sermon. That was a reaction against the posh, pretty style of certain erudites who liked to be flattered by their great oratorical art, where God had nothing to do with it. So preaching, administration of the sacraments, and notice, celebration of the liturgy. Now, this also comes into the period as a powerful tool. People become aware of the great evangelizing power of good liturgy. It's something which heals the emotions and gives access to God directly and access to the heart directly by God. It creates a space where heaven can act. So it's not based on just the power henceforth of a human word. It's creating space where God reigns. And I would propose that again in our time. Get good liturgy and much of our noise will not have to happen. So the congregation was known as the Theatines. And John Peter Carafa, who had been ordained a bishop some years before, resigned as bishop and became superior general. In 1536, Carafa assigned Cajetan to Venice to combat Lutheranism. And it was getting that far. In the convent I used to go to a lot in the Verona area, there was, still is actually, a crucifix there where a Lutheran had come in when that crucifix had been in the town itself. And this Lutheran was keen on getting rid of all traces of superstition. And when he saw this crucifix, he got out his gun, I believe, or oh, we're going too early, it would have been perhaps a sword still, that's right, it wouldn't yet have been guns, it would have been a sword. And he had a bash at this. Now, whether it was a gun or a sword, it makes no difference because the result is the same. One looks at the legs of this 
and they have been they have pulled themselves as a human being would out of the fire. They have folded in on themselves and they're still in that protective position to this day. And in Rome, or just outside Rome, a similar thing happened. A Protestant or some kind of mischievous man came in with the same view and went for the crucifix with his sword. And to this day, one sees the sword hung on the wall of the church and it's this time the sword itself that has been bent back on itself, completely in a U. God was big enough to protect himself. And then he was sent to Naples, that's right down the other end of Italy, as superior. He died there at the age of 67, worn out from his attempts to bring an end to the discord in that city. Now, this saint has a lot to say to modern day Ireland. He preached and he worshipped. He also exercised warmth in the form of fraternal love, which drew people to himself without any huge promotions, promotions campaign, and he was good to the poor. All things which genuinely let Christ radiate far better than any apologetics or loud noise on RTE. But as regards the other bit, that too is going on. God, remember, is with us and not against us. And so when we argue our faith, we remain serene in the faith that we have received and not commanded, for it is the faith of God. That is, it is the truth of God. And all we are doing is discovering it. It doesn't depend on us. And to back it up, we have precisely not just that kind of miracle, which has largely been lost in Ireland because of the Reformation. There's not much geographical continu continuation with the past. But we have other things going on, and quite a lot. I get quite a few people coming to me still. I just put uh, yesterday actually to my draw, I've forgotten about it, a recent miracle that somebody picked up at Medjugorje. Things happen on camera, in the negatives. So other things too have been going on, and they're modern because, they, as I say, they appear on negatives and films, and therefore are not quite so dismissible as things that people just say. But they are to be harnessed because God is speaking our language. I've told you before about the miracle picked up on video quite by chance in Venezuela when a double miracle happened, the pilgrims went from the north to Latin America to venerate the bleeding host, which happened there at a midnight mass on the 8th of December, to honor the Immaculate Conception. It bled at the elevation, and therefore the mass could not be finished. So it was taken there into a special reliquary and honoured, it still is. But then this person came and he saw also a second miracle and he saw it alone. It was also on fire, like the Sacred Heart we venerate on this first Friday. It was actually burning and had the appearance of the heart and it was captured. He had the instinct to put his video camera on, no one else could see it, but the camera picked up what it saw. He sent the footage to the bishop afraid that he might be hallucinating, and the bishop calmly replied, we can hallucinate, but the camera only records what it sees. And you can see it for yourself. I think Sanford is his name. It's on YouTube. But other things happen too. This one was given to me the other day, and it shows something of what's going on when we are at the altar. Remember that, altar boys, you're right next to all this every time you're coming close to the consecration. Right round you, there's a whole army of hidden angels fluttering around and waiting. Well, way back, 
This also was perceived by quite a few mystics, how much presence there is around the altar. This is St. Hildegard. On one occasion, when the priest vested went up to the altar, I saw a brilliant light coming from heaven, irradiated the whole altar. This light was not withdrawn until the celebrant left the sanctuary at the conclusion of the Mass. I noticed that when the priest got to the Sanctus and began the canon, a flame of extraordinary brightness shot down from above upon so it was coming down from above this and at that point upon this stream of light she could see something happening with the elements themselves. This stream of light then rose as it were from the elements to heaven and when they descended, they were transformed into true flesh and blood, though to the eyes of man they yet appeared to be bread and wine. As I gazed upon this flesh and blood, I saw the signs of the Incarnation. The birth, the passion of our Saviour, reflected in them as in a mirror. And just as we know these events to have been accomplished when the Son of God was on earth. So we have all that going on before us, which means that we are outside time, that we are, as it were, at the foot of Calvary. Now, the old rite favours contact with that because there isn't much of the human. Many priests now, if you watch the way they celebrate, they're actually talking to the people, even at the consecration. Their body language and their way of pronouncing the words of consecration themselves, seems also to be somewhat horizontal. They're very much aware of the people. Well, the old rite has none of that, and therefore none of that for you either. It means that if you want to, you can be, as it were, completely outside geography and space, outside time even, and caught up into that invisible world which has been slightly indicated to us through these great mystics, for our sake. St. Gertrude the Great, she was given quite a deep light and intuition as to how much is going on at the altar. Indeed, she had such an intimate relationship with Jesus, her friend and saviour, that at times he would console her as a friend would console the best of friends. He would say to her, what boss would you like me to sing to you? And so she would hmm, come up with one that she liked particularly, and he would sing to her. But he didn't sing strumming a guitar. He sang what was out there, received from the early centuries, what we are still using here. The calm, unhurried Gregorian chant, the language of the Church, which the Son of God can well use, the which she would perhaps not do so easily for much of our modern liturgy. My man is performing very well, but the graces are often very meagre.